Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for Taking It to Heart, Addressing Cardiovascular Disease in Women, part of our Value of Diagnostics within Women's Health series. I am Irina Nigne, Chief Science Officer of the Society for Women's Health Research. SWHR is the thought leader in promoting research on biological sex differences in disease and improving women's health through science, policy, and education. Spanning from simple blood tests to x-rays to invasive procedures, modern diagnostic tests and procedures are an essential part of clinical care, aiding in the detection and monitoring of diseases and informing treatment decisions. Innovations in diagnostics can provide access to valuable information to help women make informed decisions about their health care across every stage of their lives. SWHR's Value of Diagnostics Within Women's Health series highlights important the importance of advances in screening and diagnostics technologies and approaches throughout the lifespan, with a focus on how we can improve health outcomes for women, particularly relating to reproductive health, healthy aging, and cancer. We are pleased to have two distinguished panelists joining us today for today's public forum in recognition of February being American Heart Month. Dr. Nisha Goldberg, Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine and Medical Director at Atria Institute, New York City. Dr. Jennifer Hall will also be with us, who's the Chief of Data Science at the American Heart Association. I would also like to thank the sponsor of today's event, Roche. We will be live tweeting during this event and invite you to use the hashtag SWHRTalksDiagnostics and hashtag SWHRTalksHeart on social media. Heart disease is a leading cause of death for women in the United States, particularly for white and African-American women. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention also reports that for Hispanic, Asian, and Pacific Islander women, heart disease is second only to cancer as a cause of death. The risk of heart disease increases with age. During midlife, women tend to develop more risk factors for heart disease, in part due to the body's decline in the production of estrogen after menopause. And because heart attack symptoms differ between men and women, women are diagnosed less often with heart disease. However, heart disease is a preventable disease. The presentations today will highlight sex differences in heart disease that can help improve prevention, diagnosis, and treatment for women, as well as emphasize ways to empower women to adopt healthy habits that may improve cardiovascular outcomes throughout their lifespan. Now I'll introduce Dr. Nisha Goldberg to talk about screening guidelines, diagnostic tests, and how they support women's cardiovascular health. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Goldberg. Thank you, Irene. It's great to be here to talk to women about something that's very near and dear to all of our hearts, and that's preventing heart disease. And I'm going to get my slides up. And as Irene has said, heart disease is the leading cause of death and disability in both men and women. And it's important to note that in the last 10 years, women's awareness of heart disease as a leading health threat has decreased nearly 20%. A very common question that I'm asked in clinical practice is, what's the difference between cardiovascular disease and heart disease? Well, cardiovascular disease includes the heart muscle, the blood vessels, the heart valves, and the electrical system of the heart, otherwise known as the heart, the, the powerhouse of the heart rhythm. The leading conditions that affect women are cardiac coronary heart disease, which is disease to the blood vessels that are supplying the heart muscle, stroke and hypertension or high blood pressure. And as many people know, high blood pressure is both a risk factor and a disease, a risk factor for heart attack and stroke. And also untreated high blood pressure can lead to enlargement of the heart and symptoms of heart failure, which is another cause of cardiovascular disease death as well as arterial disease. And when we talk about other cardiovascular disease, that includes the heart valves and the electrical system. And for the purposes of this talk, we will be 
discussing ways that to focus on risk factors for women and members of their family, as well as the diagnostic tools we have to help us diagnose coronary heart disease. And we're going to talk about some of the traditional risk factors that you've been hearing about a lot, especially to the good work of the American Heart Association, such as high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, high cholesterol, diabetes, physical inactivity, um, eating a diet that's high in saturated fats, family history, and as Irene discussed, as we get older, our risk for heart disease increases. And men and women share these risk factors, but I want to point out, in particular in women, the risk factors of cigarette smoking and diabetes take an even greater toll on women than it, they do on men. And cigarette smoking triples a woman's cardiovascular risk and diabetes actually can increase women's heart disease risk three to five fold. And I wanna point out that in studies um, that have been done, that even before you have an elevated glucose or blood sugar that says diabetes or your sugar is in the pre-diabetes range, your risk for heart attack increases. And it's really important in terms of the traditional risk factors, those that we're really good at evaluating in the doctor's office, is that you get a baseline checkup to see where your risk factors are. A simple visit to the doctor can get your blood pressure checked, blood testing for cholesterol and diabetes, and a discussion with your healthcare provider about an exercise program that is something that you can begin and stick with, as well as how you can improve in, in some of your diet um, choices. But really what we need to focus on and look out of the box because traditional risk factors may count for about 80% of a woman's cardiovascular risk, but we need to look at other factors that are more female specific. And it's important to widen our net and our thinking around the healthcare team because the other factors involve pregnancy-related risk factors such as high blood pressure during pregnancy or preeclampsia, a condition during pregnancy where you have high blood pressure and protein in the urine. This can affect about 10% of pregnancies. Having autoimmune disease like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, they're inflammatory conditions. And we know that inflammation can be a stimulus to the buildup of the plaque or the cholesterol and inflammatory cells in the walls of arteries that can narrow them, as well as having chronic kidney disease and some cancer therapies that we give such as radiation therapy to the left side of the chest can accelerate disease in the coronary arteries, those that supply the heart muscle. Car um, intravenous chemotherapy, uh, some of the chemotherapies have shown to increase risk for heart failure. And it's important to know that you, when people, when women have breast cancer and other conditions that require radi radiation and chemotherapy, that those, those therapies are very important to treat the condition you have, but it's also doing something that women often do and that's multitasking. So you keep your primary care doctor and if you have a cardiologist in the loop about the conditions you're being treated for so we can account for how we're going to follow you. It's also important for women who are diagnosed in pregnancy with high blood pressure that oftentimes the blood pressure improves after delivery, but those women are lost to follow up from the medical visits. And it's really important for those women to remain active in the healthcare system so we can follow them. And it's believed that 
the reason why some of these pregnancy related risk factors are a problem is because they can lead to inflammation or arterial dysfunction. In other words, our arteries, when we're healthy, are very modal. They expand when we have need greater demand, like when we're exercising, and they contract. Once someone has coronary heart disease, their mobility is impaired. And that, that is uh, partially because of the inflammatory factors and the plaque that's built that, that is in the arterial walls. And that's what we know in medical terms as endothelial function, dysfunction, meaning the, art, the lining of the arteries are not functioning so that we can expand and contract that easily. There are also hormonal factors, as Irene mentioned, as women go through menopause, there's an increase in cholesterol, high blood pressure, and blood sugar, as well as some other conditions like polycystic ovary syndrome, obesity, and cardiometabolic risk, which incorporates obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure, and particularly elevated triglycerides. So it's really important that it's not a one size fits all prevention plan, but women incorporate their whole healthcare team in terms of participating in heart disease prevention. And we need the healthcare system to become more enlightened so that all practitioners, no matter where they are, can spread the word and help improve the risk factors for women, particularly at risk for heart disease. I also wanna point out there are some social considerations such as education and access to healthcare and the um, disparities between deaths due to heart disease in, in black women and Hispanic women are at greater risk for these risk factors and death due to heart disease. And that's something that we clearly have to move the needle on, as well as psychological risk factors such as depression, anxiety, loneliness, and stress. A recent study published in circulation, the Journal of the American Heart Association pointed out that men and women who have marital stress and have had heart attacks have delayed recovery from those heart attacks and a greater risk for recurrent symptoms. So we have to include not only traditional risk factors, but women's specific risk, risk factors, and also include a mental health assessment to really give women a complete assessment of their cardiac risk. In terms of the diagnostics, I'm happy to say that we're actually thinking more about the cardiovascular risk and some of the unique properties in women in terms of what their arterial disease looks like. So many people are familiar with the treadmill exercise test where you walk on a treadmill and are monitored by an electrocardiogram and your blood pressure is taken in intervals. This is considered a functional assessment for cardiovascular disease. Typical person will have symptoms of shortness of breath or chest discomfort on exertion. And the treadmill exercise test is an objective test to uh, evaluate those symptoms. And we look for changes in the electrocardiogram. However, we found earlier on, early on that oftentimes there are false positive tests, meaning the test is abnormal, but the woman doesn't have heart disease in the treadmill exercise test. So that we improve by adding imaging to a, a stress test. And that's one of the ways we do that is with stress echo. And with the stress echo test, we, we do a baseline ultrasound of the heart. The woman walks on the treadmill and immediately at the end of exercise, we repeat those images looking at those, comparing the rest and the exercise images to look at the contractility. And after the exercise, if one of the walls is the, of the heart is a bit sluggish, 
we know that that's likely due to a, a, a clogged artery. And it's felt that particularly in younger woman, women, a stress echo is a good exercise imaging test because it doesn't involve any radiation. We use ultrasound. We also have testing to look at the anatomy of the heart, which is the CT coronary angiogram, where you can get a CAT scan with an injection of dye and we can opacify the arteries and look to see if the arteries are obstructed. These have This test has a role, particularly if there's an abnormality in the treadmill exercise test, or if we're interested in getting an anatomical anatomic assessment of the arteries. And it also helps in terms of not only looking at the obstructed arteries, but also arteries that have some plaque but are not completely obstructing the blood flow. I want to point out that many more women have non-obstructive disease and symptoms of heart disease than men, and the CT coronary angiogram can pick up some of those non-obstructive images. We also have the ability to do uh, myocardial perfusion imaging, where we use a radioactive tracer injected with exercise, or we can use medication to simulate exercise for those people who have orthopedic limitations. This test is helpful in terms of someone um, in similar situations to using the stress echo. And it is helpful, but sometimes in women, because of our anatomy, particularly in the chest, there is what we call breast artifact, meaning that we can under-diagnose heart disease. So this test is helpful, but not always the best test. PET scanning is another nuclear medicine test, which happens to be a bit better for women in that we also able to get a look at disease in the microvasculature, um, the smaller blood vessels that are not seen on CAT scans. And I want to point out that microvascular disease occurs in about a third of the women who are coming in um, with heart attack symptoms. And oftentimes they go through traditional testing and are told their arteries look fine. And it's not really that their arteries look fine. It's that the tests we're using aren't able to pick up the disease that we're looking for. And also um, we're able to look for coronary microvascular disease, disease in stress magnetic resonance imaging using an MRI scan to look at the vascular system. We also use cardiac magnetic resonance imaging to look at the muscle of the heart um, and it can distinguish the difference between someone who may have had a heart attack or inflammation of the heart. And some of you may have heard about using cardiac magnetic resonance imaging to look for myocarditis with concerns with the recent, with the COVID-19 pandemic. So in fact, when it comes to testing for coronary artery disease in women, we have many tools and it's important for us to choose the right tool based on the symptoms of the patient and the condition that we're looking for. We also use another test with CAT scan and that's called a CT calcium score. And that's used as part of a screening for risk factors where we look at, get a, a, a score for plaque buildup. I wanna point out that this is a good tool for women who may be at intermediate risk or have an early family history, but also wanna point out that oftentimes women have coronary disease that doesn't have the buildup of plaque, but in the microvascular system. So although what I'm happy to say is that we are finding out more about women's cardiovascular um, disease 
in that we have research that's going to support additional testing in the future. And I want to just point out that I just am trying to get to my last slide. So um, that by remaining in tune to important differences that mark cardiovascular risk presentation and pathophysiology in women, that we are going, we have taken and will continue to take big steps toward eliminating the, eliminating the inequalities and disparities that still mark cardiovascular treatment and outcomes in women. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Um, please note that those who are tuned in live can submit questions at any time using the Q&A function um, on their screen. We will try to address as many as we can during the panel discussion portion of this event. Next, we will have Dr. Jennifer Hall, who will discuss gaps to address in cardiovascular research and care for women. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank you, Irene, and uh, wonderful to follow you, Nisha. Hopefully I can, um, you've done a lot of the work already. There's not um, a lot more I can fill in, but I will do my very best. Um, thank you everybody for joining today. It's wonderful to see so many people on the webinar. Unfortunately, um, as Nisha pointed out, we've made a, a lot of progress, but there's a lot of work left to do. Um, approximately less than half of women today are, are aware that cardiovascular disease is their leading cause of death. And less than half of women entering pregnancy in the US have optimal cardiovascular health. And a lot of the reasoning behind that last of fact is because they may have high blood pressure. And there's a lot of other reasons for that. Um, and Nisha touched on that, but these are startling facts that we really need to change. Next slide. So I will put a recent paper of a presidential advisory from the American Heart Association that was led by the pioneer, Dr. Nanette Wanger, who worked with us um, from the American Heart Association and several leaders in the field to put together um, really where the field was and a call to action on what needed to be done. And this was the infographic that we came up with. And it has really a six pronged effect. And to reduce the risks and burden of cardiovascular disease in women, there were six things that we really needed to focus on. Number one was to raise awareness. Number two, optimize prevention and clinical care. And some of that may be on things that Nisha touched upon. The first, you know, sometimes visit to a clinician for women is their OBGYN. So cardiologists probably need to make a better connection there for women. There are other things that we can do by reaching to them in their community and AHA and other uh, groups, including the federal government are doing things in that regard. Supporting research. Um, there's a lot that we can do here. In the purple, you'll see addressing data gaps, improving clinical trial participation. Women's uh, participation in clinical trials is low. It's always been low. In fact, women were not included um, for many, many years. And so the American Heart Association has programs. One of them is called Research Goes Red, where you can Google that and you can sign up for free to be involved in surveys and join clinical studies that you are interested in joining. So that's one way to, that we are working to improve clinical trial participation for women. Uh, fourthly, engage communities. There are school-based programs, community interventions, and faith-based initiatives that have come a long way in helping women uh, reach, really reach them where they are. Women are busy, um, especially after this pandemic. We learned a lot from that pandemic about helping women where they are and how we can devise programs that are really hyper 
local, we call them. And research is changing in that regard. In the last year or two, a lot of research is becoming hyper-local, that is engaged in the community and reaching out to individuals in that community that then work with and network with individuals that are focused on data science and or bringing all of that data together to help us better understand what factors are important for reducing the risks and burden of cardiovascular disease in women. Finally, um, the last two, advocate. Social determinants of health, we need more people to advocate on behalf of these social determinants and structural determinants of health and public policy and legislation um, to make health equity an important factor of everything we do going forward. Finally, um, monitoring progress is critical. If we do all of these things and don't monitor progress, we're no further ahead, really, to understand what is it that we are doing in each of these areas that's working? What is it that we're doing in each of these areas that's not working as well that we need to improve upon? Next slide. So the knowledge gaps and research needs in epidemiology and prevention for women. I've broken them down into these five areas. And it starts with developing and deploying risk calculators that may incorporate sex-specific or sex-predominant risk factors. And that may not be something that you think about every day, but the risk calculators we have now do not take into account anything to do with pregnancy. Um, and the, da the data to support, you know, there are data that are out there that show that if you include that in women greater than 50, that it doesn't have a particularly strong effect one way or the other. So it has been looked at, but for women under the age of 50, perhaps under the age of 40, it may be making a difference. And we need to begin to do bigger studies broader studies looking at women that are younger, especially now that we know that uh, women's maternal uh, risk is, is high. So thinking about things, especially since we have the means of machine learning, artificial intelligence, bringing greater data sets together and data sets that include individuals from underrepresented groups and across all walks of life. So this will be very important in developing uh, and deploying these risk calculators that can only get better and address women's cardiovascular risk. Fostering cross-disciplinary research, um, Nisha touched on this, on social determinants of health and design interventions to address these determinants, not only social determinants, but mental health as well, um, as well as those psychosocial psycho aspects. Define and implement, define and implement cross-disciplinary research and interventions. And those are the types of things that are driven by communities, urban developers, economic researchers. There was a, a, a report done by WAM and the RAND group, and I'll also put that in the chat, um, that brings together economic experts with science experts. And that's so important for helping us understand how do we best spend money in areas that makes a big difference in these gaps? So we know the gaps, but where is the money best spent to see the biggest return on investment? And for the most part, we've not built that bridge and we really need to start defining that. Finally, adopt and implement across two key areas. Adopt and implement risk factor interventions that embrace intersectionality and cultural sensitivity. And unfortunately, we've not done a great job at that in the past. And we need to start thinking about ways we do that better every single day and adopt and implement a lifetime approach to risk management and prevention. As Irene noted at the beginning, 80% of cardiovascular disease can be prevented. And so how do we help women today and men adopt this risk management and prevention for a lifetime approach to preventing cardiovascular disease. And women are really the, the, 
the person in the home that you know takes care of the family at least it is you know still moving in that direction and so for the mother to be healthy and the be the role model for the children is so important as we continue to think forward so let's consider that um, as we continue going through the slides next slide please I have two more slides and um, it will be quick. I wanna talk about the investments in women's heart health. National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute budget is approaching 4 billion per year. It's about 3.8 billion now. From 2008 to 2019, roughly, very roughly, about 5% of that budget was spent on women's health. I'm going to say that again. About 5% of that budget, overall budget, was spent on women's health. Now, we need to do a much better job of that. And we need to advocate for more money being spent towards women's health overall. There are some things that are happening that you should know about that are exciting. NHLBI Women's Heart Health Research. This is what's happening. There's a chronic hypertension in pregnancy trial called the CHAP trial. Um, improve early intervention to promote cardiovascular health of mothers and children. This is Enrich. And the other is New Mom to Be, another program started by this um, commitment from the NHLBI to women's heart health research. All fantastic programs. CDC Wise Woman, a new multi-year grant application to be released this April. So keep your eyes out for that. Let's go to the next slide. My final slide. So the CARIL Act, many of you probably know about this. Um, this is Cardiovascular Advances in Research and Opportunities Legacy. Um, you may know the history behind it. It's not that important, but it brings 20 million annually for five years to support valvular heart disease research. The CDC will support 8 million annually for five years to conduct public education and screening for valvular heart disease and surveillance of sudden cardiac arrest, which certainly has been in the news recently. So in addition to all that, AHA is doing a number of things um, to put women's heart health um, first, and to do a lot of, of things that promote health equity in our research um, funding. In fact, we've given over $100 million in the last year and a half to our health equity initiative. So with that, I will turn it back um, to Irene, and I will put those two papers in the chat for everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. Um, you know, again, this is this is opened up for a very wonderful conversation. I invite you both. I see your videos are on. And again, we invite attendees to submit questions using the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen. We will try to address as many questions as we can in the remaining about um, five, 10 minutes of this program. And uh, please note, that our conversation today is intended for educational purposes and not intended to or implied to serve as a substitute for medical or professional advice. Uh, we encourage all patients and consumers to confirm information and consult with their healthcare provider to determine their individual needs. And so with that, I'd like to open up the conversation and ask you to start um, probably Dr. Goldberg, can you reiterate the nuance between heart disease and cardiovascular disease? Because I know these terms are often used interchangeably, but if you can just help to clarify the difference again. Sure. So when we talk about cardiovascular disease, we talk about um, the condition of things that are specific to the heart as well as the, as well as the blood vessels all around our body. So if we look at cardiovascular disease as the title and um, heart disease is a subtitle, meaning it affects the heart muscle, the heart valves, the coronary arteries that supply the heart muscle and the um, electrical system of the heart. So heart disease is a form of cardiovascular disease. 
Thank you. And you got a couple questions that are in, so we're going to try to, some of them are pretty quick to round bottom. Can CVD be inherited? And um, follow up to that, given the disparity seen in women, should women have a cardio, should women pursue getting a cardiologist proactively? And this can go to either. Yeah. Um, that's a great that that's a great question. Yes, um, coronary heart artery disease or the disease that's responsible for heart attacks can be inherited. Um, that is one of the risk factors of family history. So if your mom was over sixty and your father, a mom over sixty five, your father over sixty, that increases your risk for coronary heart disease. Um, and to recognize a family history, it's also um, if there are young people in your family who have had heart disease, we've all heard about younger relatives who are 38 and 40 who have had heart attacks. It's really important if that's your brother or sister or, or you're a mother and you're, you, you're, you have children or a father and you have children, those children should be screened for heart disease risk factors. Um, there are genetic tests for certain forms of current heart disease. And usually those are inherited arrhythmias that we do genetic testing for as those sometimes run in families. And I wanna point out that high blood pressure and high cholesterol also can run in families. In terms of if you have, a, if you have risk factors, that are not being addressed by your primary care physician, or let's say you're being treated for high blood pressure and it's very difficult to get it down, then I think that's a good idea to have a cardiologist. If you have an early family history of heart disease, that's also a good time to see a cardiologist to outline a preventive plan for you. And uh, Dr. Hall, um, there are a couple questions about inclusion. Are there, what kinds of initiatives are being developed to include more research for women of color or even policies that require to include women in general when it comes to CBD research? Many, um, there's many different types of research for both of those. Um, so to include more women of color in projects and in, in clinical trials. There's funding from the National Institute of Health to fund projects like this, and also funding from the American Heart Association. Um, in terms of, um, I'm sorry, the second question was? Um, requiring, um, what efforts are being made to have policies requiring researchers to include women? Yes. So there was a policy finally, um, slow to finally be um, passed, but a policy that now for most, if not all NIH studies and American Heart Association funded studies, you must include women. And for preclinical studies, you those are studies in animals, um, you must include female um, whatever you're studying, female animals, and at least 50%. And so that's a huge change. You, you know, why we weren't doing that before is unbelievably um, sad. So those are all being done today. There certainly can be more that could be done. I'm not saying it's solved, but there are research opportunities out there for those things. And there's a policy. And so um, one thing that I, you know, I was reading a recent report from the NHLBI, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, um, that indicated the risk for heart failure was significantly and higher, was significantly higher in women living in rural settings versus urban settings. And this is also for men. But what advice would you give to women to mitigate this risk? I know sometimes in these settings, there may not be as much access to innovative or advanced screening tools. And so when there's limited resources that can be a barrier, how can we better support access and coverage this, these diagnostics? What, what advice would you give to women in these settings? Nisha? Well, I, I mean, I think um, we have a very low tech approach, Irene, to um, evaluating for blood pressure. We have very good home blood pressure monitors. 
Um, I think that is especially in the rural settings, the fact that we've gotten so good through the pandemic with telehealth care that um, we could reach out to people all over in terms of increasing access to a communication with the doctor. And I think um, for something like blood pressure, having a combination of home blood pressure monitoring and telehealth available, that's a good start to getting blood pressure under control. I think there also has to be an effort to reach out to rural communities in terms of education to increase awareness about right. high blood pressure um, being um, one is a one of the leading causes of heart failure in our country and getting it treated and getting it down. Great. I I know we are we are coming um, towards the end of our time. So I'm going to try to wrap this question into our closing. And so we often have patients and healthcare providers, but also researchers and policy professionals that tune in to our webinars like this. And so um, your closing or takeaway that each of you would recommend um, more so, um, let's see, in talking about um, what recommendation would you give concerning, you know, supporting, or rather, how about this? If you could be on your soapbox for about two seconds on um, the area of research that you would like to shine light on to bring extra attention to address heart health in women, what would it be? Nisha. Okay. Well, <laughs> if I got on my soapbox, I would really want the secret recipe to help uh, to engage younger women to acknowledge the, taking care of their hearts and it it may very well what what's really going on now is finding the right messaging to get younger women to have an approach where whatever they do for health benefit it also includes their heart I couldn't agree more. I will take that same message and say, help young women through social media be understand that their blood pressure and their cholesterol and their life choices matter today for their heart health going forward. Everything they're doing today matters. Great. And while I did say that was the end, I did actually, this is kind of open up briefly, if you could each give a soundbite for older women that might have, what can they, what advice would you give to address if they have a risk factor or, you know, I'm 60, I might be 70, you know, what can I do now if I did it then? I would say, go uh, check your blood pressure, go to the pharmacy, go to the local, you know, drugstore where there's a place to get your blood pressure checked when you pick up something and just get your blood pressure checked. Check in, you know, with the American Heart Association has something called Life's Essential 8. You can Google that. Just check in, check in with your doctor. And that, that's the very best thing you can do. And I would say that it's never too late to prevent heart disease. And it's really important to engage with your healthcare provider on your personal cardiovascular risk factors, and also encourage women to have an open mind about the things that they can do themselves in terms of lifestyle changes, as well as using medications if necessary to control a risk factor like high blood pressure. And I don't want people to get down if they feel like they have a side effect to a medication because we have lots of choices and we can always find the right program for every patient. Thank you so much. That is very, very helpful. Um, thank you for being an amazing panel, for sharing your time and your insight. And we'd also like to thank Roche for their support of this public forum and SWHR's Value of Diagnostics Within Women's Health series. 
Um, SWHR will continue the conversation, hashtag SWHR talks heart, talks heart in our work to promote research to better understand, diagnose, and treat cardiovascular disease in women. Ischemic or, cor or coronary heart disease is one of the focus areas of SWHR's Women's Health Dashboard. Next slide. Through this platform, you can explore the latest national and state data on diseases and health conditions that have significant impacts on women's health across the lifespan, including public health data, research investment in progress, healthcare, um, health insurance coverage, and relevant policy implications and actions. SWHR is looking forward to highlighting additional areas of women's health that benefit from innovations in screening and diagnostics. Our next event in this webinar series will focus on the value of diagnostic tools for screening and diagnosing Alzheimer's disease, which will be held in June in recognition of Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. We invite you to visit our website, www.swhr.org, to watch the recordings from this entire series of public forums. You can also connect with us um, on our website as well as social media to register for future events, download women's health resources, and sign up for our newsletter. We'll be sending out an email with the recording of today's webinar to all registrants, as well as post the recording on the events webpage for future viewing. So please be on the lookout for that and feel free to share with others as we continue this important conversation with hashtag SWHR Talks Diagnostics and hashtag SWHR Talks Heart. Thank you for joining us.